Hey, we're Lauren and Stephen from Triple Lifestyle, and today we're hanging out with our friend Jail Collins, author of The Simple Path to Wealth, which we highly recommend all over our blog. And more recently, he wrote another book titled How I Lost Money in Real Estate Before It Was Fashionable. How are you doing, Jail? I'm doing great. How are you guys doing? Very good. Feeling good. Back home from a road trip. Well, it's fun to be with you. I'm, I'm sitting here watching the lake and the thunderstorm roll over it, so... If we lose power and I disappear, you'll know why. It's not a lack of interest. <laughs> Thanks for the heads up. So we wanted to talk to you today about investing. Um, and in particular, we wanted to get some thoughts on, you know, people try to kind of beat the returns of index funds, um, which you've said is your favorite investment. Um, but before we kind of dive into that, I wanted to get uh, your own words on the definition of an index fund. Oh, well, that's a, that's a great question. So broadly speaking, well, a mutual fund in general is a pool of money that's invested on behalf of the, of the investors who put their money in. And an index fund simply invests that money in a specified index. Uh, so that's a pretty broad definition. There are index funds for all kinds of things these days. Uh, you can buy an index fund for gold. You can buy an index fund for energy. Uh, but the kind of index funds that, that I recommend and that I invest in myself are broad-based index funds. The one I prefer uh, is actually a total stock market index fund. Um, the specific one I prefer is VTSAX, which is Vanguard's version, although a total stock market fund for many other provider is going to be essentially the same. And those things invest in virtually every publicly traded company in the United States. Um, an S&P 500 index fund, for instance, which is almost equally uh, broad, invests in the top 500 companies in the United States. So those are the kinds of things that the kinds of index funds that I'm talking about, which are, are the biggest index funds, but also a, at this point, a small subsector of the broad range of index funds out there. We're big fans of index funds as well. We have a lot in common with you in terms of investment strategy and stuff. Um, I think it's been kind of interesting to see over the years as index funds have gained popularity because, you know, they, if you invest in one of these total stock market index funds like VTSAX or VTI is like the ETF equivalent that we talk about a lot, right. Right. Um, you know, the returns are pretty impressive when you look at them over a long period of time, you know, 10 or 11% nominal per year return. It's pretty impressive. And so I think they've developed a little bit of like a cult following where, you know, there's a certain sector of people who say index funds are like the end all be all the only way to invest. And then that sort of attitude kind of angers the other half or however many uh, other investors who think that they have a better way that they can beat right. the market or, or outperform index funds. And so, you know, we have our own kind of thoughts on that, which we'll sort of reserve throughout this interview, because we want to kind of get your take on some of those, those ways. Um, but yeah, I wrote an article for our blog that was called Beating the Market. And it kind of like examines some of those ways. So we wanted to get your thoughts on like some of those methods and your sort of response, rebuttal, agreement, whatever it may be with those one by one. Would you be up for that? Sure. Okay. So one of the most popular ways that new investors try to beat index funds is just actively trading stocks, picking winners and losers um, instead of just buying a slice of everything as we talked about. Um, so what would you say to someone who's considering doing that strategy? Well, what I would say is, is the research indicates the odds are heavily against you being successful over time. Uh, in fact, the research suggests that, that uh, in any given year, only about 20% of professional active managers who, of course, Actually, you can actually track their performance because it has to be accurately reported. So you see reality, if you will, as opposed to what individuals might think they did or tell their friends they did. Uh, only about 20% of those professionals with all the resources they have at their fingertips uh, manage to outperform in a given year. And the more years you go out, the lower and lower that percentage gets 
until some research suggests that 30 years out, and of course I'm a long-term investor, the percentage of active managers who outperform is less than 1%. That's statistically zero. Now everybody, of course, likes to look at Warren Buffett as, you know, oh, well, I'll just do what Warren Buffett did. Uh, well, that's kind of like saying, yeah, I'll just do what Mike Tyson did when I get in the ring. <laughs> You know, good luck. I mean, maybe you are the next Warren Buffett or the next Mike Tyson, but you ought to be very careful before you, before you do that. Uh, now, some people are going to say, well, individual investors have advantages over active managers. They don't have to worry about quarterly performance. They don't have to worry about redemptions. And those are genuine advantages. They also, of course, don't have access to the incredible network of information that the professionals have. But most importantly, it seems to me, when I hear people saying that they have outperformed the market, um, I'm very skeptical. Uh, certainly, it's very possible they've outperformed the market for some relatively short period of time. But I remember in my business career, I used to go to Las Vegas for conventions on a regular basis. And I would always be shocked at how many of my business associates out in Vegas for the same convention would say, yeah, you know, whenever I come out here, I always win. And I'd look up at those billion dollar casinos and think, <laughs> yeah, maybe, but maybe you're just not remembering the bad times. And right. that's the way our human minds work. Right. I definitely think half of the problem is people just not measuring their returns properly or over a long enough sample size time. Or against a benchmark. Yes. Sure, sure. Yeah. So uh, that's another thing, right, is people, people come up with a positive return. Like, for example, you know, right. in the last, say, 10 years, it would have been tough to actually achieve a negative return in investing in stocks over the last maybe 10 years or so. So people come up with a positive return and they say, hey, I'm good at this. I made money. Right. But, but the question is, how much did you make compared to what you could have made a different way? Exactly, exactly so. And I, you know, I'm a case to that myself. I, I spent most of my investing career as a stock picker or by extension, picking actively managed mutual funds that were run by stock pickers. And in fact, that's how I achieved financial independence. So I think one of the things that confuses people, and Stephen, you were just making this point, so forgive me for reiterating or maybe reinforcing it. One of the things that confuses people is it's not like you're choosing between something that's bad and doesn't work and something that's good and works. You're choosing between two things that work, or at least if you're a stock picker and you do it well, you know, you've done your homework and you've learned what you need to know, potentially can work. So you're choosing between two things that work. The difference is that indexing works better and it certainly works with a whole lot less effort and time. My single greatest regret, especially when it comes to investing, is that I didn't go there sooner because the path would have been easier and, and more importantly, more lucrative. So if you're an individual investor and you're trying to just uh, pick individual stocks and sort of beat the market going, it, going at it yourself, I mean, you've indicated that you know only 20% of people maybe on average uh, beat the index funds. Uh, what do you think is like the, the underlying reason behind that? You know, it seems like it should be easy. It seems as if, if you just went out and you just avoided the obvious bad companies, the obvious dogs, you could outperform an index that invested in everything. Or if you just went out and picked the obvious winners and, and just bought those, you know, you should be able to outperform. But the problem, of course, is sometimes the obvious winners are companies like Enron. Uh, and sometimes, you know, the, the obvious dogs and losers are companies like Apple. Probably a lot of people listening to that are shocked to hear me say, Apple, a dog, a loser? But there was a time uh, in, in Apple's career where it was not at all certain that it was going to survive, uh, where it was not a highly regarded company. Apple has had its ups and downs. Um, and now, of course, you know, it's, it's at the top of the game. Who knows for how long? I'm an index investor. I don't have to care. 
I, Fair I, enough. <laughs> I think like for me, one of the most convincing things uh, to sort of give up on the idea of stock picking was like that essentially, if you are going to be a stock picker, you are inherently competing against everyone else in the marketplace. Absolutely. And those people are making their own judgments about what the price of each stock should be. And so you, you, you pointed out moment, it should be easy. What's up? They're doing that moment by moment too. Right. And, and you, you pointed out, well, it should be easy. It seems like it should be easy to just pick out a company that's an obvious loser, invest in all the other companies, and you'd have a, at least a slightly better return than the index fund, right? But what people I think don't realize is there's this magic mechanism of price uh, where the obvious losers in the market are priced so low as to still be attractive. Like you mentioned, you know, Apple decades ago was, was priced quite low and was considered a, maybe a higher risk or a, a sketchier Period. company. Well, that low price is exactly what gave it room to end up outperforming in the long run, right? That, that, that disbelief in the company was priced into the stock price and people don't realize that. And at that, at that given moment, you know, the company can turn around and, and go on to new heights as Apple did, or it can continue to decline and, and disappear forever. Sure. Uh, you know, the, the, there's a Wall Street caution against trying to catch a falling knife which is, you know, you got to be very, it's very dangerous to, to try to buy a stock that is on its way down because you think it's becoming more and more of a bargain. You might be right, but it may, I remember, and again, this is a long time ago, so names that won't matter to people, but I was having lunch with a client of mine. We were talking about stocks and he had just uh, bought Braniff the last time we talked, which was an airline and uh, it was $2 a share. And uh, I said, how did I, you know, how did the, how'd your brand of uh, investment work out? He said, yeah. He said, you know, when I bought that, I thought to myself, it's $2 a share. How low could it possibly go? He said, I found out it can go to zero. <laughs> <laughs> brand brand of went out of business. <laughs> he lost everything. I was going to say, I don't recognize that, that name of that airline. Well, that, and that's why. <laughs> So, you know, not not every stock that is is down, uh, it turns around and goes back up as 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 Apple did. But you, but you're right. At any given moment, all of the available information that all the investors who are trading or are buying and selling at that given moment, that's the price that collectively they have decided uh, a given company is worth. Uh, whether that turns out to be a bargain low price or or the last all-time high before the end, you know, is nobody knows because nobody can see the future. We've kind of dispelled to some extent the idea of stock picking or paying a mutual fund manager to do the stock picking for you, which of course introduces fees into the already questionable plan, right? But, you know, there's the old investing wisdom that, you know, uh, if you take, if you can take more risk, if you're willing to accept more risk, you ought to be able to uh, expect more potential reward. And if you're willing to take less risk, you might expect less reward. So that's the idea behind, you know, the stock market versus the bond market, right? High risk, high reward, low risk, low reward. So for someone who's dead set, let's say on trying to, their goal is I want to beat VTSAX. I want to beat the stock market index fund. Would you say uh, there's any valid strategy that involves like taking more risk? Like let's say buying, instead of picking stocks, maybe buying a small cap index fund or maybe taking on leverage in their investments. That is like taking a loan at a lower interest rate to try to make a higher interest rate in their stock market investments. Can that work? Well, sure. I mean, it can work, but uh, you know, if you, if you, uh, use leverage, for instance, which is basically borrowing money. Obviously, if the market goes your way, then you will magnify your gains. The problem is if the market goes against you, you will magnify your losses. And when you, 
when you introduce leverage, now you have introduced a situation where you can actually lose everything. If I invest in VTSAX, unless the entire economy of the country collapses forever, and, and I'm, I'm never going to lose everything. I mean, I could lose a huge percentage. You know, we could have another Great Depression uh, where stocks fell 90%. So I could lose, you know, I could theoretically lose 90%, but I'm not going to go broke. If I'm using leverage, I'm absolutely going to go broke. By the way, leverage is, is what really triggered the depths of the Great Depression because investors in the 1920s, and that was a raging bull market, and they were so enthusiastic that leverage had just gone off the charts. And so when the market turned and the people who were leveraged got what's called margin calls, which means the broker holding the stock wants you to make good the money you borrowed, or they will automatically sell your shares. Well, people weren't able to meet their margin calls. And that triggered this automatic selling, which of course exacerbated the, the collapse of the market. Uh, but the difference was if, if you had a million dollar portfolio in 1929 and it was leveraged, uh, well, once the market had fallen 50%, you were done, you were out, you were broke. If you weren't leveraged and that million dollar portfolio dropped 90%, that's obviously a pretty terrifying thing to go through. But at the end of the day, you still have $100,000. Oh, and by the way, because the Great Depression was deflationary, that $100,000 now buys considerably more than it bought before the market began to crash. So that mitigates the damage a little bit. But the point is, you're still, as long as you don't panic and, and sell, you're still in the game. And, and you can wait for that $100,000 to, to grow back again, presumably, if the market goes up in the long run. Which, which is exactly, of course, what happened after the Depression. And that's what always happens. And, and then, especially if you were continue, if you were still working, and of course, unemployment was pretty horrific in the Depression. It was 25%. But that means 75% of people were still working. And so if you had the intestinal fortitude to continue investing every month, as we recommend, the Great Depression would have worked out all right for you. In fact, would have worked out pretty, pretty well. And now that's a big if, you know, how many people are willing to take a 90% hit and keep investing. But mathematically, it works. So anyway, my advice would be I would never never margin uh, my stock portfolio. I had a feeling you were going to say that. Even, even though there's no question that if you, if you had done that 10 years ago, you would be far further ahead today. Well, you know, with higher risk can come higher reward, but the part that people tend to gloss over is the higher risk part really means higher risk, right? right. So we've kind of talked about, you know, how tricky it is to beat the stock market within the stock market. But what about taking your money outside of the stock market? Um, real estate is probably one of the most popular alternative investments to the stock market. Um, is that a more legit way to beat the stock, stock market index funds? Um, I know based on that book title, you might have some thoughts on this. <laughs> so uh, uh, again, the, the, res the research is, is pretty clear on this. Looking back for you know, 100, 150 years, there, there is no asset category that has outperformed stocks. So st if you want to be in the top performing asset category of all, stocks is where you want to be. Now, real estate, uh, I'm not opposed to investing in real estate. And there are some, there, a lot of fortunes have been made in real estate. There are a couple of caveats. Uh, caveat number one is that real estate investing very commonly uses leverage and it's a little safer and it's not safe, but it's a little safer in real estate because parcels of real estate are not as easily traded as, as stocks are. And, and that ease of trading makes things happen much more quickly in the stock market, which makes the leverage a little more dangerous. But the other thing about uh, real estate investing is you, it's a part-time job or maybe a full-time job. It takes work. 
if you're going to be a successful real estate investor, you had better take the time to learn the business because that's what it is. It's, it's a business like any other business. You wouldn't, you wouldn't become a shoe repair person without learning about how to repair shoes. But it's a little stunning to me how many people think they can get in the real estate investment business without really taking the time to learn about that business. But if you take the time to learn about it, and that's how you want to spend your time, if that's that's how you want to, uh, you know, that's what you want to do is be in that business. And there's absolutely there's money to be made in it, and leverage in that case can more reliably and with a little less risk work in your your advantage. But now you're comparing an investment, real estate, uh, paired with a at least a part time job, to something like an index fund, which is just a pure investment. So the real comparison is, do you want to be invested in real estate and have that part-time job? Even if you're thinking to yourself, oh, I'm gonna hire managers to run my properties. Well, now you're a manager. You have to go and hire those people and you have to manage them. So it's always a level of effort above what owning a, uh, an index fund is gonna be. But yes, there's money to be made in real estate done well. So you have a book that was published last year, 2021, titled How I Lost Money in Real Estate Before It Was Fashionable. So uh, do you have any like personal experiences to tell us about when it comes to real estate investing? Well, I mean, that, that, that book uh, it tells the story of the very first piece of real estate I bought, which was my condo in, in Chicago when I, was a, when I was a young man. And and uh, I mentioned a moment ago that it's critically important if you're going to invest in real estate that you take the time to learn that business. Well, of course, I didn't do that. I mean, that's, that, that's how I know it's critically important is because I was too stupid to, to do that. In fairness, I actually bought this condo be, to live in, uh, but even that process, I, I, didn't, I didn't take the time to learn how to effectively uh, buy something and what to look for. You know, th this was a, a building, a condo building. It was an apartment building that was being converted into condos. It was a gut rehab. And, and I didn't have anywhere near the knowledge base to know what that entailed and how I should manage the process and, and how I should pay attention to it. So uh, I, got into, I got into it to live in. And that was a bit of a disaster because I, I didn't do my homework and I took things for granted. And then when it was time to move on, uh, you know, my, my life moved on from that uh, condo, the real estate market turned from being red hot for condos to being ice cold and I couldn't sell it. So I was stuck with it. So now I wound up being an accidental landlord and that meant I wound up owning something that in those days, real estate investors called an alligator. An alligator is a piece of real estate that whose expenses are far larger than the rent the market will allow you to charge, and it's financially eating you alive. And so now I I, I, I owned an alligator. So that's the the book is is that sad, long, painful <laughs> tale of woe that hopefully is a cautionary tale for for other people, uh, for anybody who is under the illusion that you always make money in real estate, whether you're buying it to live in as your residence or you're buying it as an investment, uh, read this book uh, before you go further. We, we've been pretty lucky with real estate so far. <clears throat> we, we bought our first condo in Gainesville. It was very inexpensive, $71,000. And I think it's, it's just about doubled in price since then. But our, our kind of strategy going into it, I guess, was we were buying it as a place to live for ourselves, but we only bought it um, because it had the numbers that, that sort of supported the idea of using it as a rental property at a later date. And so that's what we actually ended up doing with it. When we moved away from Gainesville, we turned it into a rental. So far, it's been about as passive as I think 
real estate investments can be. Our favorites still really are stock market index funds, but- Yes, I dread the like text message that something isn't working. And then, you know, for some reason, like handymen tend to not stay handy. They like disappear off the face of the planet and you go to call them and like the number's disconnected and you have to find a whole new suite of people to help you, especially if it's a a long distance type of thing. Like we're a a little over an hour from there now. So the only, but it's only, he's only, I think called like twice where something we had to have replaced or whatever. So it hasn't been, it hasn't been bad at all. I would would count us lucky. I don't know if we were super smart in picking our real estate, but we've at least. I I think a couple of things. So first of all, the, the fact that before you bought it or as you were buying it you analyzed it as a potential rental is is a very smart thing to do when i was buying my chicago condo that i wrote the book about i didn't even know that was a concept i didn't even know that was <laughs> something to consider so it's not like i i said oh yeah that's i should do that but i'm not gonna bother i didn't even know that 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 that's what was potentially something to do. I think you got lucky with the appreciation. I think a lot of people, for sure, uh, you know, confuse uh, fortuitous appreciation with with skill. I think that's that's luck. Uh, but I think Lauren, you just made for me, and the reason I don't invest in real estate anymore, because I did learn from my mistakes and I did go on to invest in real estate profitably. But there's there's always this sword hanging over your head when when you own real estate, or at least that's the way it felt to me. And you expressed it very well. You know, you dread the call that comes because something's broken because you don't know when you call and reach out to the the handyman that you used last time. It was so great if their phone's going to be connected. Yep. Uh, and then you're scrambling around. I just didn't. That's not how I want to spend my life. Yeah. Now, there are a lot of people, you know, for whom that's a fun and active challenge <laughs> or even or even have those skills themselves. And <laughs> and those are the people who ought to be investing in real estate. But I'm, I'm not one of them. Real estate is way too much like work for my taste. Fair enough. Yeah, I feel uh-huh. that. <laughs> and your point about appreciation is is a really good one. When we were doing the calculations on, you know, what to expect from the property we were buying, we assumed over the long run, a three or 4% per year appreciation. And it turned out to dramatically exceed that. But when you really sit down and look at the numbers, you know, I think people, people look at their grandmother's house that was purchased 50 years ago, and they say, Oh, it, it doubled or it quadrupled in value. Well, if you actually sit down and do the math on that, the, the percent per year return is pretty modest on most appreciation over the long run. Right, not to mention the ongoing uh, maintenance and repairs that it sure. takes to keep that building in a condition that it can appreciate and that it can sell for more in the future. So another one we're curious uh, to get your opinion on in terms of beating index funds. Maybe, maybe it's better to compare to a bond market index fund, maybe it's better to compare to a stock market index fund. But just curious, uh, are you familiar with these Series I savings bonds or these I bonds that everyone's been talking about for like the last six months or so? A little bit. They're, they're these government guaranteed savings bonds that are linked to recent inflation. And so, you know, we have a whole video on that (laughs) yeah so we made a video about it and like blew up on youtube because apparently people are going going crazy over this recently so what are your thoughts on these i bonds well i mean first of all if if i understand correctly and i'm not an expert in them but there's a limit of i think ten thousand dollars right so you can only buy ten thousand dollars worth of these things a year Now, for some people, $10,000 is a lot of money. I mean, that might be their entire investment portfolio. And the last time I looked, they were returning something like nine and a half, 9.6%. So that, that for those people, could be very, very attractive. If you've got a million-dollar portfolio, then $10,000, it's probably not worth the effort to chase that return. The other thing you have to bear in mind, as you pointed out, they are tied to the return on these things is tied to inflation. And when inflation is going up, that works very nicely. But if inflation goes back down, well, your interest rate is going to go back down along with it. So 
you shouldn't delude yourself into thinking you have bought something that's going to continue to pay nine plus percent for an extended period of time. Yeah, I think those are those are exactly the catches with them. And the ten thousand dollar limit, you know, may be relevant for some, maybe not relevant for others. But I do think the second part uh, is is highly relevant. A lot of people are viewing these things right now because they're hot. They're saying, "Oh, I'm going to buy as much of this as I can possibly get." The return is nine point six percent, and that return, if you look at it historically, has been dramatically lower than that and it's likely to return to being lower because you know hopefully inflation (laughs) will be tamed back down a little bit and so the question is are those people really paying attention to know when to jump back out of those at the right time and then jump back into a more productive investment like a stock market index fund to get the return they're actually seeking full full disclosure we bought $10,000 $10,000 each worth of I bonds in April um, because we calculated the absolute worst case scenario on it because there are, there are specific terms on them. And that's right. what makes them weird is that with stocks and even a bond market index fund, you don't know exactly what's going to happen, right? Uh, the, the return is variable. And we just looked at it as an alternative to BND or VBTLX. Right. That was pretty much guaranteed to beat it over the next 12 months or so, but right. we don't view it as a long-term thing. We're just going to jump out when the return drops back down and then just jump right back into a regular bond market index fund. And I think that's fine. I, you know, but I, I'm not sure how many people who are buying them have that level of sophistication. Yeah. Right. And it, and to your point earlier, like it is a little bit more work to pay attention to these things and jump at the right times. Right. Another investment that people are really getting into lately is crypto. So what are your thoughts on that? (laughs) My understanding is these days, that's an investment a lot of people are getting out of. (laughs) Well, perhaps now, but in terms, like lots of people I've seen talking about it, even though it's going down, they still devote, like they have decided to devote a portion of their portfolio, a small portion, but still a portion nonetheless to some crypto. small some 100 uh, percent sure we, uh, we definitely... you, you know i won't make any judgments <laughs> as to which which is correct there but the uh that you know they're they have they're putting some faith in this as a as another asset to invest into and I'm, I'm wondering your thoughts on you know the viability of of crypto in your in your mind especially compared to again right. because investing in stocks because certainly you wouldn't say, well, it's down 50% or whatever this year, therefore it's a bad investment. You know, sometimes the stock market's down too. Why do you not advocate for crypto then? Yeah, so let, let me let me answer that um, as if you were asking me this uh, back in November when crypto was still rocking and rolling. Sure. And, and then I'll add a couple of comments given where crypto, crypto is today. So... Um, for anybody who's, who's interested in, in looking at this in depth on my blog, if you go to the search function and you enter uh, Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies or something like that, you should find three posts. Uh, two of them are done by uh, Lucas, who is, does the tech support for my blog, and he is uh, a holder of crypto and an advocate for crypto and, and uh, a believer in it. Still is, by the way, uh, even with the decline. Uh, recently, and he makes, I think, one of the the best cases for investing in crypto that I have seen. <clears throat> You'll also see a post from me as to why I don't invest in crypto, and I probably never will. In a nutshell, and let's let's go back to last November when when crypto was was still riding high. Um, I see crypto as a speculation. Uh, it's kind of akin to gold in that in that regard. It's the kind of thing you buy, uh, hoping that at some point in the future somebody else will pay more money for it than you pay. Uh, now, when you buy a stock portfolio, there are companies that you're buying that are actively engaged in providing products and services and and generating cash flow, and that that's what drives fundamentally the value of those things up. But something like gold and crypto, there is no underlying activity that's driving the value. It's a matter of what people perceive it's worth at any given time. 
and I'm not a speculator, and that's a speculation in my view. So that's one reason I don't own crypto. The other uh, characteristic of crypto is the currency part of it, of course. Uh, but crypto, at least at this point, uh, and this would be true back in November, and it's certainly true today, crypto is far too volatile uh, to serve as a currency. One of the reasons that inflation, when it gets out of control, is so devastating to economy, or deflation for that matter, is suddenly the currency doesn't work anymore as a medium of exchange, right? It loses its stability. In an inflationary environment, <clears throat> um, people with things to sell are gonna be reluctant to sell them because they figure that tomorrow they can get more money than they can get today. So they're gonna be reluctant sellers. And at the same time, buyers feel that the money they have in their pocket today is gonna be worth less tomorrow. And so they wanna convert it into something tangible. And that, when that gets pronounced, that, that dynamic economies lock up and because the currency just doesn't work anymore. Same thing happens in a deflationary environment when the value of currency starts dropping dramatically in a deflationary environment, well, <clears throat> sellers can't wait to get rid of whatever they have uh, because they're going to get less for it tomorrow. And buyers, on the other hand, say, gee, you know, this refrigerator that's $500 today might be $400 tomorrow, so I'm going to wait. And again, the, the, the economy locks up. Well, crypto is, has that level of volatility that the deflationary or inflationary currencies have. And that means that in any real sense, it's not a functional currency. Now, at some point in the future, that volatility may settle down and, and cryptocurrencies may actually be able to be used on a regular basis as a currency, but we're not there now. So in my mind, you have a very speculative investment that can't function in the way it was created to function. And that's why I am uninterested in it. Yeah, we've kind of viewed it from the same lens of, yeah. of just like whether or not it is a productive investment, like you said, you know, producing cash flow or producing profits in some way like a stock does. In the case of, at least to keep things simple, in the case of like Bitcoin, there is no underlying business activity, like you mentioned, right. that should generate a return from it. So it is speculation. And, and we also have a blog post, too, that, that basically compares Bitcoin to gold in the same way. And, uh, you know, at best, you, you view it as a currency. Maybe that has validity. Maybe in the future it'll be uh, uh, used that way. But if it is, in the best case scenario, if it is a currency, do you really want to buy currency as your investment vehicle? W would you invest in, you know, U.S. dollars or or gold or silver or euros or whatever? That's sort of the way we've looked at it. Well, and again, that's a speculative part of it because you are basically saying you think it is going to be a stronger currency than well, currencies that are available to you now, the, the dollar or the, or the yen or the euro or the pound right. or whatever. But then fast forwarding now, because of course, current uh, cryptocurrencies have been beat up pretty badly. One of the other uh, hopes uh, was that crypto would, would be a counterbalance to a declining stock market in the way some people hope that gold is. And of course, that hasn't happened. Now, I'm not sure why. I, I, I probably would have guessed that it would have done better when stocks were sliding, but in fact, it's done worse. So it's, it's not a good counterbalance in your portfolio to a possible stock decline. So I think the, the concept that that might be the case has been kind of blown out of the water. Kind of more proof that it's just hard to guess what's going to happen in any of these markets. Right. Uh, so we have two more uh, alternative investments for you to sort of respond to. Um, sure. So the, the next one is... I'm probably not going to like these either. But... <laughs> <laughs> so, well, we kind of touched a little bit on this next one, like briefly. Yeah, a little, a little bit with the real estate. It's kind of related to that. But, you know, sometimes I think people say, hey, I've got a chunk of cash sitting around and I could invest it in the stock market. I could invest it in an index fund and I wouldn't have to do anything. 
um, and it, it would, you know, grow over the long run. That's a good deal. But, but what if I have a great idea? What if I have a, a business idea or something that I feel like I can have some personal control over? Um, do you think that that's a valid or a good way to try to beat the stock market? Well, you know, so I, I, it turns out you have come up with an alternative that I, that I kind of like. Um, so first of all, I, uh, most businesses fail. Most new businesses fail. So it's very tricky to launch and start a new business. Uh, but I, I am in favor of that kind of activity because there is tremendous upside. And even if your business fails, you will learn so much in the process of failing that, that obviously you would hope that it would be a financial success, but it's not like you'll come away empty handed. And if you have that entrepreneurial drive, uh, then each failure that you might go through sets you up for, for the possibility of, of greater success. And I think there are probably a few things that are financially more rewarding, uh, or if you have that drive, more satisfying uh, than, than building a successful business. Um, but yeah, I would, you know, if, if you have that entrepreneurial spirit and drive, and you recognize that you will work far harder doing that, at least initially, than you would in any job, and there's a great deal of risk, I think it's well worth doing. And it's a great learning experience. But again, you need to have a benchmark, right? And your benchmark should be, um, am I going to be able to take whatever money I have and invest it in this business and outperform the index fund? And as you pointed out over the last 50 years or so, broad-based index funds have returned 10, 12% a year. That's a pretty high mark. So unless I was looking at a business that I thought could return significantly more than that, because now I'm putting my own personal time and effort into it, I would, I would, that would be my litmus test as to whether to go forward with that business. And that's a pretty high bar, but it, but it should be a high bar uh, because you're investing not only your money, uh, but also your time. Final thought I would leave on that is my friend, Alan Donegan, uh, runs Rebel Business School. Yeah, we know which, Alan. Yeah, you know Alan, and and he does a great job of teaching people how to start businesses mm -hmm. without borrowing or investing money. Uh, so it's a very low risk uh, venture. You're only risking your time in that uh, in that regard. So I highly recommend Rebel Business School. It's free and it's only a couple of weeks. And you will learn how to how to start a business effectively. And it definitely definitely has a lower risk at entry oh. using his plan. Yeah, the worst I mean, the worst thing people could do is say, I have a business idea, and now I'm going to go out and try to borrow a bunch of money. Yeah. Yep. Because business, even the best ideas are, you know, you need a good idea, but you also need a great execution. Mm -hmm. And it's a it's it's a high bar to make a business succeed, but. but but it's a cool thing to do. Absolutely. The, the funniest comparison of these two things, index funds and investing in your own business, we interviewed Jeremy Schneider from Personal Finance Club. I'm not sure if you know him, but um, we interviewed him recently and he actually made the bulk of his wealth initially by taking his money and reinvesting it into his own business that he started, paying himself a very small salary, just enough to live on. Right. And, you know, then he exited, sold the business for millions of dollars. And then the, the funny end to that story, though, is that he now runs Personal Finance Club, which advises people to spend less than they earn at whatever they do and invest the difference into simple, low-cost index funds. So it's kind of funny to hear someone who, who did it the other way to still say, no, listen, this is the, the surest and simplest path to wealth. Well, it is the surest and simplest path to wealth. If, you, if you're an entrepreneur and you are successful, you will do much better. Uh, you know, the, the upside is much greater, but the odds are heavily, heavily against you. And 
it takes an enormous amount of effort. I mean, working at a, at a regular job is, is just, it's a lot easier. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I mean, I agree with, with what he said. And it's interesting that even to hear that from somebody who is, who did it. Yeah. has built the business successfully uh, because he recognizes what it took to build it. And he probably recognizes how lucky he was or how much skill Kind of a combination of luck and skill it took to be successful and and how easily it could have gone the other way it's a lot easier too i mean if you're just working your nine to five just living below your means and investing that difference in index funds is a lot simpler a lot less work yeah right. almost everything we have gone through so far takes significantly more effort and can than be risk can pressing, be a lot riskier. pressing the buy button on uh on an index fund right so well i mean you can set for that. The buy button you can set aside you could set up an automatic uh investment <laughs> that's true you don't even have to press the button that's more true. than once <laughs> which by the way i highly recommend because you if you're going to do this you should invest you should live below your means and 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 invest that money on a regular basis and you should automate it. Yeah. So you don't find yourself thinking, oh, you know, the market's down, should I invest this month or not? Trying you to should, time it, yeah. You know, the market's up, down, sideways. It's the consistency that, that pays off in the long run. So we have one more uh, and I will say, you know, we're big fans of index funds. That's how we personally invest ourselves. We've been biting our tongues this whole time, just letting you do the work of, uh, of are you against all these things? Telling us the disadvantages, pros and cons of all this stuff that, that people come up with. And that was kind telling of the purpose. You what you already know, right? Yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, that was the purpose of me writing the article, but, but we wanted to hear your perspective on it because you're such a, a an advocate for index fund investing and, and simple investing. This last one, I will just come out right from the gate and tell you, this is one of my least favorite ones. I have almost a personal vendetta against it, uh, but curious. I love it already. <laughs> <laughs> curious to get your perspective on this one. Uh, what about these amazing universal or whole life insurance policies that I'm constantly being sold as an investment where I buy a life insurance policy and then it accumulates value in the background and grows and it's guaranteed and I don't have to worry about the volatility of the stock market. I can just get rich with my insurance company. <laughs> <laughs> that was his best uh, sarcastic pitch. That's a good idea, right? Like I should definitely do that. Well, it's a great idea for the guy selling it. Um, so first of all, the, the, the answer to that question is sort of embedded when you say, I'm constant, constantly being sold these things. Right, so anything that somebody is constantly trying to sell, sell you is probably not a great investment for you because they're not constantly trying to sell you this to make your life better. They're trying to sell this to you because it will make their life better. How does it make their life better? Well, these things pay enormously high commissions to the people who sell them. They are enormously lucrative for the companies that issue them. Uh, the companies, by the way, don't look for highly trained investment professionals to sell these things who really know about investments, right? They, they tend to look for people who don't know that much so they can persuade their salespeople to drink the Kool-Aid first. So the salespeople you're talking to probably truly believe that they are offering something wonderful to you. Uh, they certainly know that if you buy it, they will handsomely line their own pockets. Uh, but all that money that lines their pockets and the pockets of the insurance company comes out of your investment. These things are heavily laden with fees. There is no uh, reliable research that indicates that they perform particularly well. In fact, the research indicates they typically perform very poorly. Uh, in my view, you should never mix insurance with investing. They are two different things. And anybody who tries to sell you a product combining them is selling you something that benefits them, not you. The thing yeah. that maybe convinced me the most about them is, is you have to ask yourself the question, where does the insurance company get the investment return to pay to you in your accumulated value? 
And the answer is they're just investing the money in the stock market, taking a, a cut, a commission from that along the way, and then passing on the remainder of that money, if any, to you by the time you cash in your policy. So why would you ever pay that middleman when you can just invest directly? Yeah, we, we agree 100%. <laughs> Being the authority that you are, sometimes it's nice to uh, have you kind of dispel some of the things that we see going around and, and being a little pervasive in personal finance um, that isn't getting talked about enough. And I think risk um, and alternatives to the market are definitely some of that stuff. So um, thank you for being on today. We had a really great time. Uh, yeah, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, so. I'm always honored when you ask and, and I always have a great great deal of fun hanging out with you guys so uh, pleasure to be here thanks for uh, thanks for having me on the show thanks thanks if you like this kind of stuff don't forget to subscribe or follow along on your favorite social media platform